Okay, so before we start today, does anybody have any questions for me? Nothing? All right. Um, so now we're about to begin an extremely uh, useful topic that uh, you'll see again many times uh, over the years. Um, and really, these are the main, the main reason uh, for us to study uh, probability is, uh, at least in computer science, you know, there's a few things that we've sort of seen. We've defined events and looked at the probabilities that they, they happen. But a really critical sort of random thing that we've not discussed yet is uh, what's called a random variable. And you'll be a little bit surprised um, at the definition of this thing. Um, so let's say for a probability space S, um, probability space, even just a sample space uh, a random variable uh, or x on s is just a function it's a function that takes an argument from S, so it takes an outcome as an argument, and it gives you a real number. Okay. So um, that's the the definition of a random variable. So in fact, you don't even need a sample space. All you need is a set, and it's just a function that takes elements from that set and maps each element to a real number. Um, so, we've seen things like this before. In fact, uh, we've seen the following example. When we roll two dice and take their sum. So, in this uh, sample space of rolling two dice, that's this set of ordered pairs, i and j, where i and j are integers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. So it's this 36 uh, element set. <clears throat> um, not important right now. It's a uniform probability measure over this set. And we've looked at well, you roll two dice, then you add them up. So, uh, you know, you roll a three and a four, and you say, well, I rolled seven. Or you roll a, a two and a, uh, a four, and you say, I rolled six. So in that case, what's the random variable that we're talking about? Well, that's the random variable that should take any element of uh, S. So an element of S looks like a pair, ij and maps it onto the real number i plus j. So, um, so there's an example of a random variable, one that we've, we've seen before. All right? Um, so a familiar one. So here's a, uh, another example. Let's say I uh, toss three coins. So that means I have a sample space S, 
which consists of sequences of three coin tosses. A coin toss is a head or a tail, which we denote by H or T. And there's eight elements in this sample space. And they look like that. So we get a sample space of, uh, of size 8. And uh, it's a uniform sample space. So the probability of omega is 1 over 8 for each omega in S. So let's define a random variable uh, x which will be, we'll write it, so just like events, we sometimes write random variables in plain language, and let's say x is the number of heads. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, so that means, uh, if I want to write it out more formally, then I'll have something like, uh, well, x of this one here, tails, 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 is equal to 0. Uh, there'll be another one, which is x of heads, heads, heads. That's equal to 3. Uh, in between that, we can have... Uh, either one head or we can have two heads. sort of written out in plain language, and, but really this is what it looks like, right? So uh, if you want to know what the value is, just look here for one of these things. Just look here and you'll see it's either uh, 0, 1, 2, or 3. All right. Um, so far, so good. Let's define another random variable over the same, um, same set of outcomes. And let's say that's a random variable y. And maybe y determines whether or not you win some game, where winning the game is uh, getting three heads or three tails. So you might say y is either a 1 or a 0. And that depends. If, uh, if omega is uh, head, 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 or omega is tail, 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 and it's zero otherwise. So just another, uh, another example of a random variable. Does it satisfy the definition? Yes, it's a function from our set S. On to real numbers. Yeah, 1 and 0 are real numbers. 0, 1, 2, and 3 are real numbers. So everything uh, satisfies the definition. And that's all this is right now is, uh, is a definition. Um, OK. So a uh, few sort of basic things about this. Um, these random variables, you can uh, use them to define events. Sometimes they're, uh, they're really convenient in defining events. So for example, if I look at the event, uh, well, in general, if I say, let's look at the event x equals x. Uh, 
then what is that event? Well, that just means you look in your set of outcomes and you keep exactly the ones where the function evaluated at that thing is equal to x. So, for example, the event uh, x equals 0 in this example, well, when does x equal 0? x equals 0, there's only one element in s that causes that to happen. So that's just this set. On the other hand, the event x equals 2, well, that's all of these, these three things uh, give you, uh, evaluate uh, to 2 when you apply x to them. So that set is this one. Nothing, nothing new or, or terribly exciting here. We've already seen you can define events all kinds of ways just by saying something, and that means you have to figure out what subset of the this, this sample space S this corresponds to. Um, all right, so far so good. So, few things we can do, um, and let's do them here just so we, we get a feel for this stuff. Um, so since saying something like x equals 0 or x equals 2 defines an event, that means we can compute the probabilities of, uh, of these events. So for example here, here's all the things that evaluate to 0, so we can say the probability that x equals 0, well this is, uh, there's only one thing that, uh, that evaluates to 0, and it occurs with uh, probability 1 over 8, so we get 1 over 8. On the other hand, the probability that x equals 1, well that's a set of size, that x equals 1 is an event of size 3, so that's 3 over 8. And the probability that x equals 2 <coughs> is also 3 over 8. And the probability that x equals 3 is 1 over 8. Okay. So let's keep that off to the side. <coughs> And y is a little bit simpler. Um, the probability that y equals 1, what's that? Yeah. 2 over 8, because there's exactly two things in this sample space where a y equals 1. That's when you get heads, 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 or tails, tails, tails. So that's 2 over 8. And the probability that y equals 0, someone said it, 6 over 8. Um, here that's easy because we didn't even have to list them because, uh, well, uh, y is equal to um, 1 or 0. So the probability that y equals 0 is the probability that y is not equal to 1. So we just use the complement rule, so it's 1 minus this, which is 6 over 8. It's all the other outcomes. All right. So um, we've got this notion of random variables now. And uh, that's good. And random variables, they somehow give rise to naturally to events. Um, and here we see, you know, for the same uh, set, you can have sort of different random variables. Here's two examples of random variable, both uh, for the same experiment. So um, we saw that events can be 
independent or not. So maybe the same thing is true for random variables. Because uh, hopefully so, because we saw that independent events, somehow they're easier to work with. Probabilities are easier to compute. Um, so is, is the same thing true uh, with random variables? Do we get to, to do the same, same stuff? And indeed, let me just carefully write down the definition. Uh, it won't be surprising at all, except that uh, there's sort of another layer uh, in there. Uh, so, so we let S P R be a probability space. And let X and Y be random variables. S, and we say X and Y are independent if here's what's different from events. You take any little x and little y, real numbers, then uh, the probability that x equals little x and y equals little y should be equal to the probability that x equals little x times the probability that y equals little y. Um, so what's the difference here? Well, when we talked about two events, that's all there was, right? When we talked about independence between events A and B, we would just say that the probability of A and the probability of B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. Um, the difference here is that a random variable defines a whole bunch of different events, right? For everything that it could, every value that it could possibly take on defines an event. An event. Um, and so what you need is that uh, all of those events, so every event that can be defined using x and every event that can be defined using y, those things should be independent. So another way of saying this, this is exactly the definition of independence uh, of events. So that's just saying the events x equals x and y equals y are independent. And that's for any choice of, uh, of little x and little y. So let's test that definition because we have two random variables here, x and y. So this one x is the one that counts the number of heads in our three coin tosses, and y is the one that gives us a one uh, if the, we get three heads or three tails, um, and zero otherwise. So are x and y independent? Who wants to hazard a guess? No, you've all been burned too much before by these things. What's your intuition? Yeah? That they're not. And if we think about it, so the nice thing when they're not independent is we don't have a lot to check. We just need to provide a particular counterexample, right? So independent means for every value of little x and little y, this has to be true. So all we have to do is find a value of little x and little y where this is not true, and then we can immediately say uh, big X and big Y are not independent. And uh, well, this, this value, when y equals 1, that means we got three heads or we got three tails. So um, does that mean could we have gotten one heads in that case? Right. It's either three heads or three tails. 
or if you like, three heads or zero heads. So that means if y equals one, then it looks like none of these two things can happen, right? Then x can't be equal to two, and it can't be equal to, uh, to one. Um, it can be equal to zero, or it can be equal to three, but not, not these other things. So just to find our counterexample, let's take y equals one and x equals one. And just make sure, make sure this works. Um, so let's say uh, the probability that uh, x equals one and y equals one, that is the probability of, well, x equals one is this set of three elements. And y equals 1 is the set with one element, uh, two elements rather, uh, this one and this one. Right, that's what it means. x equals 1 and y equals 1 means that your, the outcome was in this set, this is the event x equals 1, and it's in this set, this is the event x equals uh, or y equals one. Uh, what's the intersection of these two sets? Zero, the empty set. So that's just equal to the probability of the empty set, and the probability of the empty set is zero. Okay, so that's one half of it. But then we should also check that that's not equal to the probability that x equals one times the probability that y equals one. That's an easy one. The probability that x equals one, we can read it off from over there. That's three over eight times uh, y equals one is two over eight, uh, which is not equal to zero. And therefore, x and y are not independent random variables because this does not equal to this. Okay. All right. Um, well, so let's define another random variable then. Let's say, uh, take the random variable. So we'll make a, a note here. Uh, X and Y are not independent. Let's define the random variable z to be, in plain language, uh, we'll write it as it's a one or a zero. And it's one if the first coin toss is heads, and zero otherwise, or zero if the first coin toss is tails. So in particular, the event z equals one looks like this. event z equals zero, well, these are the things that start with tails. Okay. <clears throat> um, so what's the probability that z equals one? 
can think of it, well, just look at the plain language definition. If the first coin toss is heads, z equals 1. I mean, that seems to happen with probability a half. But if you don't trust that, just look at this event, z equals 1. That's four things, uh, each of which occurs with probability 1 over 8. So it's 4 over 8, which is also a half. And the probability that z equals 0, well, that's also 4 over 8 by looking up here, or by using the complement rule on, uh, on the complement of z equals 1. Okay. Um, Are Z and Y independent? So if I tell you that the first coin toss is heads or not, does that tell you anything about whether the, you got three heads or three tails? I don't see an obvious counterexample, um, which is annoying because that means we don't get to just pick a value of x and y and say, ah, here's where they're not equal. Now we have to try all values of x and y, uh, little x and little y. So we're going to have to do that. Luckily, uh, there's only four things, right? Two choices for y and two choices for, for z. But um, let's, let's just check them. Uh, so, if I look at the probability that z equals 1 and y equals 1. Okay, so that's the intersection of two sets. Um, so, z equals 1, uh, here it is, and y equals 1 is this set. So what's the intersection between those two things? Yep. Three heads. Three heads is, there's only one element that's uh, common, right? Z equals one means we're only interested in the sequences that start with a head, and Y equals one means we're only interested in the sequence that's heads, 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 or the sequence that's tails, tails, tails. Well, tails, tails, tails doesn't start with a head. So, uh, so that's just the probability of heads, heads, heads. Uh, and the probability of that is just 1 over 8, because it's one of the eight possible outcomes in a uniform probability space. Um, on the other hand, the probability that z equals 1 times the probability that y equals 1 uh, the probability that z equals 1 is a 1 half. The probability that y equals 1 is 2 out of 8, which is 1 out of 8. So unfortunately, uh, we have to keep going because this one passed the, the test over there. And we have to equals 1 and y equals 0. Okay, z equals 1 means we start with a head, and y equals 0 means that we don't get heads, heads, heads. So what do those look like? Well, we start with a head, and we don't get heads, 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 so that means for the next two coin tosses, normally there would be four choices for them, but one of them is excluded, the heads, heads, heads choice. So this gives us uh, heads, tails, tails, uh, heads, tails, heads, and heads, uh, heads, tails. All right. And this is three elements. So this is 3 out of 8, and 
On the other side, if I look at the probability that z equals 1 times the probability that y equals 0, the probability that z equals 1 is a half. The probability that y equals 0 is 6 out of 8. So that's 6 divided by 2 is 3 out of 8. And indeed, again, these two things are equal. Probability z equals 1 and y equals 0 is equal to the probability z equals 1 times the probability that y equals 0. Um, would you like me to continue? I can tell you now that these things are independent. We need to check the cases uh, z equals 0, y equals 1, and z equals 0, y equals 0. But uh, we'll, get, we'll get the same result in, in either case. So would anyone like me to do that? Would anyone not like me to do that? Okay, good. Overwhelming majority in favor of not, uh, not continuing with this, this boring exercise. Um, so dot, 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 z and y are independent. That may or may not be a surprise to you, but it, it's not immediately obvious because uh, y depends on all three of the coin tosses, and z depends on the first one, so they, they have something in common that they depend on. So it wasn't obvious that they were uh, independent, but somehow uh, they are anyway. Um, what do you guys think if we ask about uh, z and x? Are they independent? So Z says the first coin toss comes up heads. X is the one that uh, counts the number of coin tosses. So are those two things independent? So if the first, if z equals 1, meaning the first coin toss comes up heads, can x equal 0? I have no heads. No. If the first coin toss is heads, then the number of heads in my sequence is 1, 2, or 3. So in particular, we can show that they're not independent by looking at the <coughs> probability that uh, z equals 1 and x equals 0. Uh, that probability will actually be zero because, uh, because the intersection of those two events is empty. On the other hand, the product of the two probabilities should be, uh, should be one over eight and, uh, and one half. So not in particular, it's not equal to zero. Uh, so finally, <coughs> Z and X are not independent. Good. So that's the boring stuff. Oh, almost. Uh, it's almost the end of the boring stuff. One last thing. Uh, and really, it's just uh, it's what you would expect. Remember when we talked about independence of events? We had this easy version here, where you only have two events, and you ask if they're independent. And then we had the version where you have a whole pile of events, and you ask if they're independent. And there was two definitions. So let me just write them down uh, very quickly. But they're, they're exactly what you would expect. Uh, so here's the definition. Let x1 to xn be a sequence of random variables. 
over a uh, uh, sample space S Uh, then uh, what we'll say is uh, x1 through xn are pairwise independent if for every little x1 up to little xn, the events, the, the events x1 equals little x1, x2 equals little x2, all the way up to xn equals little xn are independent, are pairwise. Independent. Okay. So, um, again, the only difference between this definition of pairwise independence for random variables and the definition for uh, for se sequences of events is this extra layer that we have to do, where we have to basically define all the possible events we could define with x1. Uh, all the possible events we could define with x2, all the possible events we could define with x3, and so on, and check that those things are pairwise independent. And uh, if I replace the word pairwise with the word mutual in both places, uh, mutually, mutually, then, uh, then it's the same definition as well. Okay. So, mutually independent random variables, they're really the, the ones that are great to work with because it doesn't matter what I tell you about any, uh, any subset of them, it doesn't tell you anything about the stuff that's not in that subset. And that turns out to be uh, really, really useful. And we'll, uh, we'll use that uh, a little bit later. But now, I want to uh, get to the real reason that we study random variables, that random variables are so interesting. So far, they just look like uh, more ways of defining events. But the real point of them is they allow us to assign numbers to our experiments. Um, so I do some experiment, toss a coin, count the number of heads. There's a way to get a number. Or I roll two dice, and I add up the, the two numbers that I, I see there. It assigns a number to the, that outcome. So um, it allows us to assign a number to, uh, to all of the things in our space. And the way we've been thinking about probability spaces is really in terms of experiments, right? We have a, a set S. We do an experiment and we get some outcome in S with some probability. But now you can think of, we did that experiment and what we got is a number. So the most natural thing to ask is, what's the average number that we get when we do this experiment? Okay. For example, um, I take all the people in this room and I uh, pick one at random and they ask them to step on a scale and they have their, uh, some, some number comes up, it's their weight in kilograms and uh, that's fine, okay, so, so that's, that's it, right? The experiment is I pick a person in this room uniformly at random, so the sample set is the people in this room. The, the random variable x is the thing that assigns each person their weight in kilograms. And then it really kind of makes sense for me to say, what's the average weight of someone in this room? So if I pick one at random, what's the, the weight that I expect to see on average? And that's where this next definition comes in. It's a really simple one compared to what we just did. 
so to set everything up, let SPR be a probability space. x be a random variable on s, then the expected value of x is defined as we use this notation, expected value of x. So what we do is we sum up, take everything in your probability space. Um, so this is, you know, each of the people in this room. I evaluate x for that thing, so I take that person's weight. And I multiply that by the probability that I picked that particular person. Or for this, for each outcome, I look at the probability that I get that outcome and multiply that by the number that's associated with that outcome. Okay. And if we think about this experiment with people in the room here, I don't know what the number is. Let's say there's, uh, let's say there's 50 people in the room right now. Then what is this doing? Well, this is saying uh, you take all the people in the room, uh, and just let's say I'll pick them uniformly at random. So each one is picked with probability 1 over 50. So I take the person's weight and multiply it by 1 over 50. And then the second person's weight and multiply it by 1 over 50. And the third person's weight and multiply it by 1 over 50. Uh, so really, what does that mean? That means I'm just adding up everyone's weight and dividing by 50, which is what we think of as the average weight of someone in this room, right? You take all the, the observations of weights and you divide by the number of people in the room. That's the, the average weight. And I'll write out uh, another way of writing this is to sum, and it's more convenient in many cases, over, uh, over x. And you look at, okay. So this x, uh, ranges over, you can say over all reals, over all uh, <coughs> reals, but a better way to think of it is the, the following, because if you range over all reals, then you immediately get an infinite sum or an uncountable sum, so that's uh, a bit annoying. Um, think of these two expressions here. This one is summing over all of the things um, in the set S, which in terms of this function x, these are all of the valid arguments for x. Okay. So this is uh, the sum over, the, does anybody remember for a function, if you, what is the set of its valid arguments? Remember what that's called? Yeah. Domain. It's called the domain. So this is the sum over the domain of uh, x. And over here, this looks at all of the different values that x might take on and sums over those. So this is just the sum over the what of x? The range of x. And you get the same thing, uh, same thing in, in either case, right? Because if you look at what's happening, call this the range of x for everything in S, 
x takes it onto some real number. Sometimes two things go on to the same real number. So in one case, I look at, enumerate the elements in S, uh, look at the, this uh, probability of this thing showing up, and multiply it by that number. In the other case, I look over here, I add up all the probabilities of these things showing up, that's what this is doing, and I multiply that by that, that real number. So in either case, uh, basically, each arrow in this picture contributes, uh, contributes the, the same amount. All right. Now, uh, this is called the expected value. Sometimes it's also called the expectation. And sometimes it's also called the mean. Uh, and sometimes you might see it written as the average, but I, I would prefer if you didn't use that. Mean is okay, expected value I like, expectation is fine as, as well. But, uh, but let's not call it the average, because average means something else in most contexts. All right, so let's do uh, a couple of examples. This first one is a bit surprising. So, If I toss a six-sided die, then I get the sample space S is one, two, three, four, five, six. And I can take the very natural random variable on S, which is to say that x of i is just equal to i. So if I roll a 1, then I get the number 1. If I roll a 2, then I get the number 2, and, uh, and so on. Um, so if I roll a six-sided die, what's the expected value of that? Which this is where the, the, the word expected is a bit strange, because it sounds like, what's the value you expect to see? And I'll guarantee you that the value that you get for the expected value is not, not a value you expect to see in this case. Yeah. So, turns out that the expected value when you roll a six-sided die is 3.5. So that's where mean is somehow nicer, a nicer word for it, because it, uh, it removes expectations. So just apply the definition. So we need to sum over omega in S of uh, x of omega times the probability of <coughs> omega. That looks complicated, but what's S? S is the integers. 1 through 6, um, and x of omega is just omega, so that's that thing, or x of i is just that thing, so i times the probability of i. Um, when I roll a dice, this is a uniform, or die, this is a uniform probability space. So this thing here is just always going to be 1 over 6 for any particular value. So this the sum i equals 1 through 6 of i times 1 over 6. <coughs> so that it doesn't confuse us, this is a sum where every term is multiplied by 1 over 6. So let's just multiply the whole sum by 1 over 6 instead. And does anybody remember what Gauss told us about these things? Nine-year-old Gauss said that sum like this, i equals 1 to n, 
is n times m plus 1 over 2. So we get 1 over 6 times 6 times 7 divided by 2. The 6 is canceled. And we get 7 divided by 2, 3.5. So when we roll the six-sided die, um, we get, uh, we get uh, well, the, the average value or the expected value that we see is three and a half. And there's lots of ways to think about this. I mean, the right way, of course, is that it's just the definition and that's, we applied the definition and this is the number we got. So that's what it is by, by definition. But, um, Sort of the, 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 the reason it's the definition works this way is if we rolled this, this die many, many times, like we rolled it uh, n times, and we added up all the values that we saw, actually what you'll find is uh, that will get closer and closer to 3.5 times n as n gets bigger. So basically, it really does mean it's what you expect or it's the average, but it's the average over somehow if we did this many, many times, this is what we would, uh, what would turn out as the, the average. Okay. Um, all right. So that's sort of a, a baby space. Let's try another one. two dice. All right, so uh, this is us rolling two dice, call them I and J, the first one and the second one. Uh, we'll assume a uniform probability space like we always do for these dice rolling experiments. And let's take X is going to be a random variable, which means it needs to take pairs, I and J. and map them onto real numbers. And it'll do that by taking i and j and mapping them to i plus j. So I roll two dice and I add up the numbers that I see. It's the one we've, we've seen all already. So what's the expected value of x? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Yeah? Seems reasonable. Why seven? Okay. Is there anything on the board that would suggest seven? Yeah. Yeah. So somehow. The suggestion is that the answer should be 7 because if I roll 1, it's 7 halves. So if I roll 2 and add them together, it should be 2 times 7 halves, which is 7. So we'll see that actually that's true, but we don't know that yet. Actually, all we have at this point is just this definition. Um, and the definition has two sides to it. We can use either one, um, but none of them is, neither of them is going to be pretty. So if we start working on this side, so that means we sum up over all omega in S, x of omega times the probability of omega, well, that's going to be sum that runs i from 1 through 6, and that runs j from 1 through 6, of uh, uh, i plus j, 
times the probability that the first one is i and the second one is j, but this is a uniform probability space, so each of those probabilities, at least that part's easy, it's always 1 out of 36. So, again, whenever we have constants inside the sum, it almost always makes sense to bring them in front like this. Uh, but now we need to deal with this thing. And to deal with this thing, well, we've got to fight with it a bit. Uh, so we got a 1 out of 36. Um, if I just look at the inner sum here, then I see this variable j, which is something I need to deal with. But I also see this i, which doesn't change. Right? If I hide the outside part, all I see is this inner loop where j is running through this thing, and i is not changing. So i gets added up six times here. Okay. So 1 over 36, the sum i equals 1 through 6 <coughs> of 6i uh, plus the sum j equals 1 through 6 of j. Okay. All right, j is uh, running from 1 through 6, j, that one we know, right? Um, if we add all of this up, uh, this is Gauss again, right? Gauss tells us that this is 6 times 7 divided by 2. Six times seven divided by two. All right. Um, that's good. Okay. So a couple of things we can do next. So I see a six here, and I see a six here, and I see a thirty-six underneath here. So um, these, this whole thing is multiplied by 6. This is divided by 36, which means we can get rid of all of those, these two 6s, and this is just 1 over 6. So I get i plus 7 over 2. And uh, this one is easy. Uh, 7 over 2 is just a constant in here that appears uh, how many times? Well, this, this sum has six terms, uh, and so this appears six times. So this ends up being 6 times 7 over 2. And this one over here, this is the sum i. Um, i equals 1 through 6 of this. That gives us 6 times 7 over 2. So we get 1 over 6 times... 6 times 7 over 2 plus 6 times 7 over 2. The 6s cancel out. We get 7 over 2 plus 7 over 2. And indeed, we get the answer 7 that we expected. OK, that was, that was a lot of trouble. Um, seems like a lot of work. And indeed, it, it is, and it's easy to make a mistake. Um, let's try the other, other way of doing it. Uh, so instead of summing over the domain, we can sum over the range. So what's the range of values that we get here? Uh, for when we roll two dice and take their sum, what are the possible outcomes? What's the smallest outcome? Two. We roll snake eyes, two ones, uh, we get two. And uh, what's the largest possible outcome? We roll two sixes and we get 12. So we could also try and do this by taking the expected value of x uh, is the sum. 
multiplying this thing on the, the right. So sum x uh, of x times the probability that x equals x. So the values of x we need to consider, we just decided they are any integer from 2 all the way up to 12 of i times the probability that x equals i. Um, well, that's nice. Here we basically had a term with 30, a sum with 36 terms in it. Now we have one with 11 terms in it. Um, there's one issue though, uh, this probability that x equals i is not 1 over 11 anymore. Anybody remember what this one looks like? Yeah. So we have to, if we start writing it out, we'll see that, okay, uh, the probability that I roll a 2 is 1 out of 36. There's only one way to roll a 2, I have to get snake eyes. Probability that I roll a 3, that's 2 out of 36, because I can roll a 2 and a 1, or I can roll a 1 and a 2. And the probability that I roll a 4, that's 3 out of 36, because I can roll a 1 and a 3, a 2 and a 2, or a 3 and a 1. And this goes on times 4 out of 36. So the most likely one was 7, which gives you 6 out of 36. Uh, and then it starts to drop again. 8 is uh, 5 out of 36. 9 is 4 out of 36. 10 is Finally, the only way I can roll a 12 is if I roll two sixes, so that's a 1 out of 36. And let me do this in my head. 7. Okay, so yeah, you can apply the second one, you get a smaller thing, but you have more difficult probabilities to, to work with. Neither of those seems, uh, seems great. Now let me show you the right way to do it. And this is, if you're talking about expected values, and actually, which is almost always what you're talking about when you're looking at things like when you're studying algorithms and the running time of algorithms, or the running time of code, um, things that are randomized, then, uh, yeah, it's expected values that you're, is the, the first thing that you're interested in. Um, there's this really, really important property called the linearity of expectation. And what's really nice about it is you take any two random variables. X and Y. Then the expected value of X plus Y is equal to the expected value of X plus the expected value of y. Okay. So right now you should be, uh, if you've really been following, you should be confused because uh, what are we doing here? We added these two things, but what are these two things? These are functions. What does it even mean to add functions? We better say what this means, right? So. Uh, x plus y denotes the random variable 
we'll give it a name, Z defined by Z of omega is equal to X of omega plus Y of omega for every omega in X. Okay? It's what you, th it's exactly the definition that you expect, but we, we need to define it somehow because X and Y are actually functions if we remember what random variables are, what happens when you add two functions. Well, we, we use that to, to mean that we, um, we evaluate the two functions at the same uh, points and add those two, uh, two things together. Right. And that's allowed because x of omega is a real number and y of omega is a real number and it will, adding them together gives us this real number. <coughs> okay. okay, so this says um, if I want to uh, know what the expected value of the sum of two random variables is, I only need to know the individual expected values of these things. This is extremely powerful for two reasons. One is this works for any two random variables. So we've seen very few things like this, right? When we looked at things like, oh, how do you compute the probability of A and B, we always had, you know, it's really easy if A and B are independent. Um, this doesn't require that X and Y are independent. These X and Y can be completely dependent. They can be completely intertwined. In fact, X and Y can be the same random variable. There's no, no problem there. Um, so it's powerful for that reason. And the other one is sort of the, the, the obvious philosophical one is it's letting us do divide and conquer. We have something complicated over here that we're trying to study, and we get to break it up into simple things. And we'll, we'll take that to the extreme later in the course where we'll have something really complicated that we want to study and we'll break it up into a whole bunch of the simplest imaginable things, binary random variables, zero, one random variables. But right now, let's see how it helps us with our, uh, our dice problem, or let, let's prove it first. Um, so just proof, the, the proof is, is obvious. Uh, so, well, we have this, Z here, so the expected value of Z, apply the definition, you sum over everything in the outcome set of Z of that thing, that's just the sum over everything in the outcome set of Z is defined as this, X of omega plus Y of omega. Um, all right, nothing, this is just us expanding the definition of Z. Well, when we have a sum where each term has two parts, we can just split that into two sums. But wait a minute, this sum here, this is just the expected value of X right? And this sum over here, this is just the expected value of y. And so that's all, all linear of expectation, linearity of expectation is telling us is, uh, yeah, just to you know, apply the definition and you get, uh, you, you get the proof. I mean, once everything is well defined, it just falls out. <coughs> Um, all right, so someone over here gave us this annoying random variable, xij equals i plus j. It's complicated to study. Um, how can we fix it? Well, we can fix it by defining two different ran or two random variables. follows, let x1 of ij be i, the one that tells you the number that's on the first, uh, 
first value rule. Let x2 of ij be j. Then what's x? Right? This is x of ij is just uh, i plus j. That's, that's all these things are. So writing uh, using the, the more condensed notation, that just says that the random variable x is the sum of the random variables x1 plus x2. And linearity of expectation tells us that the expected value of x is equal to the expected value of x1 plus the expected value of x2. Um, what's the expected value of x1? So what is x1? x1 is me rolling one die. Right? That, that's the, the first die. So what's the expected value of that? It's right behind me on the board. 3.5 or 7 halves, however you want to say it. So this thing here is just rolling one die. 7 halves. 7. So finally, the pain-free way of figuring this out. Um, and I think you see really how useful this is now because uh, what if I told you that I was rolling 10 die? I mean, if you had to do this, you, I mean, you would have 10 nested sums in there. You could work your way through them, and eventually you would get, uh, you would get uh, 35 would be the answer. Um, or you can use the obvious generalization of this, which I'll write down in a second, uh, and you would get that it's 10 times 7 halves, which is 35. Um, so here's the big generalization. Let x1 to xn be any sequence of random variables, variables, and let a1 to an be any sequence of real numbers. So just think of all of these as one if you don't want to deal with them now. Then the expected value of a1 x1 plus a2 x2 plus a3 x3 all the way up to a n x n is just equal to a1 times the expected value of x1 plus a2 times the expected value of x2 and so on all the way up to a n times the expected value of x n. We'll hardly ever use these a's here. Usually these a's will just be ones, but know that you can, uh, you can put them there if you want. Right. And up here, this is the special case where a1 is equal to 1, a2 is equal to 1, <coughs> and uh, this is x1, this is x2. Okay. Um, and this is the most useful thing that you will learn about probability in this course. It will allow you to tackle things that, on the surface, when you first see the problem statement, you would think this is completely impossible, will never determine the expected value of, of this thing. And I mean things like, I give you some code and say, uh, 
uh, what's the expected number of times this line of code executes? You look at that and say, I have no idea. Um, and we'll see that actually by using this and a few really easy tricks, we can nail those things down to like exact values for, uh, for you know, any particular distribution on, uh, on inputs. Okay, but that's a good place to stop for today.